You guys ready for another tag video where I have not prepared? Because that, that's what's happening. This is the Brandon Sanderson tag created from Christy from, oh gosh, a name that I can never say. I'm going to put on the screen and um, I'll put a link to her channel. Great channel. She's been hosting the Storm Along 2020, which you should check out if you like want to read the Stormlight Archive with a bunch of people. They are great bi-weekly live shows for that. And she put this tag together, and then I was tagged by Michael Nip, one of my fantasy friends. So I guess I should do this tag. And I also... I like Brandon Sanderson, so I should do this. So prompt number one. Brandon wrote many early novels while working as a night clerk at a Provo hotel. What book kept you reading late into the night? That would be A Court of Mist and Fury. Not many books keep me up till 3 a.m. When I'm not stressed out of my head, I fall asleep at like 11. And even then, if I have insomnia, I don't read usually. Like, I'll try, but like, I'm too tired to read, but not tired enough to sleep. But Court of Mist and Fury consistently keeps me up till 2 or 3 in the morning when I read it or reread it. I don't know why. I just get very, especially when it gets to that, like, if you've read it, that part in the middle when, like, there's that reveal that, like, we all saw coming, but still. Yeah. All right, so two. Brandon's complex magic system set his fantasy apart. What subject do you love to read about in all of its complexity? Oof. Hmm. I think for this one, I'm going to go with, like, musical theater. Um, it's it not it, not even all of its complexity, though, but I love reading memoirs and behind the scenes of how they are created and the inspiration for them, especially with modern musicals when they do pull from a lot of older musicals but still make them their own thing. I really love musicals. So I do like when a musical comes out, I love reading about how it gets made and the inspiration behind it. I'm also like that... I mean, I guess with just a lot of media, like when I'm obsessed with a piece of media, I really like digging into it. Like, that's what I've done with the Cosmere. It's what I like to do with like, yeah, just a lot of things. Like if it captures my attention, I go into it pretty deep. But I don't know. Yeah, I read a lot more fiction than I do nonfiction, just, just on average. I know now I would really like to read more into education in America, specifically how we are discriminatory in it, not only in the redlining that makes us have segregated schools, but even within an integrated school, there's still inter like se segregation and discrimination in the tracking system, so like honors classes and like normal classes, normal, and like the lower tracks, they are discriminated in that, well, at least at my school, only the white kids were in the honors classes, and our school is 60% black, and we all had the same elementary school education. Yeah, that math doesn't work. But I would like to read more about that and the intricacies there to see how I can become a better um, advocate for those rights for people, because I hate, I hate that. So I don't know, I guess it's all over the place. I mean, I could say something science-y, but honestly, I don't do that in my free time anymore, because it's in my work life so often. Number three, Brandon gets book ideas from watching other storytellers fail to execute a concept well. He figures out how to do it better. What two books handle the same concept in strikingly different ways, and which did you prefer? I also don't, like, I love Sanderson, but I don't know if I think he always does a trope better. Um, he also is, like, because he's so well known now, he's making a lot of tropes that people will copy, so he will be the new bringer of tropes. But, um... Things that have been done better. Ooh, for this, I hate comparing the two, but I'm going to compare Spinning Silver and the Winter Night Trilogy. Both of these, I actually have Spinning Silver here. So Spinning Silver and the Winter Night Trilogy, they both are Eastern European folklore-based fantasy series. This is a standalone, the other one's a trilogy. They both have female characters that interact with like a god supernatural cold-hearted creature and I prefer how the Winter Night Trilogy approached that but um yeah they're, they're both very good though I think I accidentally read them too close to each other so that would be my one thing like because it will be almost impossible for you not to compare the two because of the similar setting and character dynamics like they are different stories but there are 
it will be hard for you not to compare them. So I think for me, I liked the Winter Night trilogy more, mainly because I got to probably spend more time with those characters, because it was a trilogy. Uh, let's see, four. Child Brandon was recommended several books about dogs that die. As a result, he became a reluctant reader. Please share a formative good or bad childhood reading experience. Oof. So I think as a kid I was lucky. I got to read a lot of stuff I liked. I do think that... Not, not even talking about classics that I was forced to read. Because I was forced to read a lot of classics and I could rant forever about how we need to have a good discussion about what our goals are for literature classes and reading classes. Like, is it a reading class or a literature class? Because those are different things. Teaching someone how to read is not the same thing as teaching someone how to analyze literature. Those are different goals. And, I mean, I have the same type of conversation for, like, science. Like, is our goal to teach the concept or is our goal to teach how to model it? Those are not the same thing. <laughs> but, anyways, uh, I do remember, I know this is blasphemy because I feel like everyone loves this book, but I did not like The Outsiders. Gosh, I was angry when I read that book. But I'd also just read a different book that I thought was for the class I was supposed to read, but it was a, the other class. And they were both just so depressing. Like, I get it, but I never got to read very many happy books in school. But I don't think it stopped me from reading. Hmm. I don't know. I just... Yeah, I don't have bad reading experiences. Like, that, that prevented me from reading more. I never became a reluctant reader. I do remember, like, this is real random, I don't know if anyone's read this, but, like, there were the Big Red Dog series. I, I don't know why. I read those because they had, like, the nice leather covers at my library, and I was just like, what are these about? And I don't think those were sad. I couldn't tell you what happened. I just remembered that's when I learned what an Irish setter was, which are beautiful dogs, and that they point and they, like, help you hunt. I don't know. This was third grade Angela. She just picked up a book because it was chonky and nothing much has changed. All right, five. Brandon and several friends host the Writing Excuses podcast, and they frequently invite guests. Please tell us about a collaborative fiction project and what you thought of it. Collaborative fiction project. Ooh, let's go with Good Omens. So that's collaborative fiction. That is Terry Pratchett and Neil Gaiman. They wrote letters to each other to write this banana story. So my first time reading it, did not get it. I was like, well, why do people love this? This book is weird. Like, and not in a weird, like, that's cool way. Um, I read it in high school, and I was like, I don't. I don't get it. It's it's fine. And then I finally read Terry Pratchett, like, as a standalone author. Because I think at that point, I'd only read Neil Gaiman. And honestly, the voice of Good Omens is Terry Pratchett. Like, if you've read Terry Pratchett and you read Good Omens, you're like, oh, this is the satire voice of Terry Pratchett. This is his humor. This is his scattered thoughts. If there's anything gross, that was Neil Gaiman. Anything with worms, that was probably for sure Neil Gaiman. And I noticed that more on a second read after I'd read Terry Pratchett, and I got I was already used to his humor and voice, and so I liked it a lot better then, and I personally really liked the TV show adaptation, but I love David Tennant, so <laughs> I was kind of predisposed to like that, but yeah, and my boyfriend really liked Good Omens when he first read it, so it has a good satire voice, um, yeah, so I, I liked that one. Although, I, it's weird, because I feel like everyone feels like it's more Gaiman than Pratchett, but I just disagree, because the authorial voice is just Pratchett. It's, it's like, super Pratchett. Like, I'm not going to say maybe the ideas were all his, but, like, if someone had just said it was only Terry Pratchett, I would have believed them. All right, what do we got? Six. Brandon's first book, White Sand Prime, was written and eventually converted into a graphic novel called White Sand. What book would you like to see in another format. I don't know. Um, hmm, looking at my shelves. Eh. I'd like The City We Became to be like a mini-series. Like, not a full movie and not like a TV show, but I'd like, you know, a four to six episode mini-series on The City We Became. I think that'd be really cool. Because you'd be able to get all the characters, and I think our special effects are good enough. I, I don't know, I just think it'd be fun to be in New York City with these avatars and they're figuring out how to fight this kind of Lovecraftian monster. I, I think that'd be great. All right. Brandon writes very quickly. What prolific author or authors would you recommend? Jemison. Um, she's written almost a book a year, a book every other year since she's been publishing. I mean, I currently own one, two, five, six, seven of her books, that doesn't include the Broken Earth trilogy, 
and all of these started to be published, I think, in 2010, 2011. That's fairly prolific in the fantasy sci-fi space, so I would say she's fairly good at getting things out in a timely manner. I mean, the Broken Earth trilogy had a book a year, I'm pretty sure. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure. So, if you didn't know, I love N.K. Jemisin. I have a spotlight video on that, so if you're someone who's like, where do I start with Jemisin? I have a video for you, and it might be helpful. It might not. It might just be me gushing. Who knows? But, yeah, I really like her. Uh, let's see. Brandison's Cosmere Universe books are grounded in platonic philosophy. What books or series gets you really excited about the source material? I feel like I have an answer for this. I'm like staring around me at all the books in my world. Um, source material, source material. Oh. Yeah. So, and I don't know if this means source material, but I really like when a book introduces me to a culture or a way of life I'm not as aware of because I haven't been exposed to it, and it makes me want to read nonfiction on it, and specifically one that came to mind recently is I read The Thing Around Your Neck by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, and I really want to read more nonfiction and fiction by Nigerian authors because Nigeria, from what I can tell from that short story collection, is just extremely diverse in its own cultural landscape, which of course it should be. It's a large, large country in both population and size. So this makes complete sense, but it's something I don't know a lot about. So I want to dig into that more via fiction and nonfiction. That's like one example, but that happens a lot when I pick up books that are set in different places. Like right now I'm reading Mexican Gothic and in it we're referencing a revolution that took place before the fifties. And I'm like, you know, I actually don't know a lot about the history of government and of revolutionary upheaval in Mexico, and I should, like, take a minute to go look into that, because, yes, it's not that important for the plot, but it's like, oh, I'm noticing a gap in my knowledge, I kind of want to fill it. So that happens to me a lot. Um, nine. Brandon loves to show multiple sides of every issue and contrast character values. Please share a book that handles controversy well. do 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 do, do. I know there are some. Ooh, Pet. Pet by Quakey Amezi. I have a review for this. Um, yeah, Pet is a whole story about how do you handle when there's a society that's ignoring the monsters that still exist. And, um, you know, it also, you know, has this conversation of also what do you do once you find the monster? What is the appropriate justice or punishment? So I think that one, that one is really good and also can start really good conversations about those, like, items that are brought up. And the last question, Brandon Sanderson is a writing teacher, and unlike some writing teachers, he posts his lectures online for free. What free literature resources are you grateful for? I will also say, I'm not sure if all writing teachers are allowed to do that. I think universities can be very, like, that people need to pay for this content. So, like, I think it's great that he does that. I'm just saying that maybe not every teacher is allowed to. Um, so what free liter literature resources are am I grateful for? My library. I think I, I mean, I could probably try and think of something more creative, but it's, it's the library. I could not afford to read as much as I do without the library. I just couldn't. I am currently on my 70 something book. Let's assume that I maybe got them all for $10. If I could, that's still $700. And I don't know how much you think grad students make, but it's not enough to buy $700 worth of books. It's just not the case. So I'm very grateful for the library, not just for like the physical books, but for their electronic collection, their DVDs, access to printing. Libraries are really important. Access to free internet. If you don't pay for your internet bill, you know that it's not always cheap because internet companies are a scam and we don't treat it like a utility like we should. Um, that's my, my rant there. And then I should tag people who needs to be tagged, who hasn't been tagged. I don't know. Let me look at my subscription feed. Let's do Kayla from Cracking Into a Good Book. She likes the Stormlight Archives. We'll do Justine from I Should Read That because we're reading The Way of Kings right now as a buddy read. Well, they're reading it. I'm just commenting because I've already reread it recently. Let's do who else, who else, who else that hasn't done it yet. Burp, burp, burp. Ooh, I'm going to do... The Princess from Castle Library, because she's going to be starting her Sanderson journey soon. So that excites me. And a book circus. We're going to do her as well. You four, 
our tag to do this tag. It's pretty fun. You don't have to know Sanderson works to do it. I do think it highlights some interesting parts of his thought process and career because, yeah, I mean, all these things that Christie put together have been like in interviews and stuff. I remember I saw him at a signing and he told the story about how, you know, before he got published, I mean, he just took jobs where he was able to write and he's a night owl, like <laughs> such a night owl. Like he like will do his streams like late at night because that's when he's like awake. He like wakes up at like noon or 1 p.m. his time or something like that. But that's it for this tag. Thanks, Nip, for tagging me. And if you've made it this far, put um, something cosmic in the comments because, you know, the Cosmere, cosmic. I don't know. I'm lame. But like if you like it, subscribe if you want to, and I will see you in the next one. Bye.